So good afternoon and welcome to the first Southport in Love and War program. So initially, when I thought of this topic, I was just going to do one program that gave an overview of several different families who had met, fell in love, and got married during World War II. Um, but as I began to do the research, I fell in love with the stories and the people and the history and all the details. So I decided that instead uh, to do a series of programs that delved deeply into one or maybe two families at a time. So um, in the past few months, if you've been coming to the armchair history programs, you know that we've tackled some pretty tough topics and I appreciate you all hanging in there with me and I've gotten some great emails and feedback and I really appreciate that. But today, um, it's gonna be a little bit lighter. Even though we'll be talking about events that occurred during World War II, it'll still be a somewhat lighter discussion of history. And it's a different perspective on the impact of World War II on Southport. And I hope that you too will enjoy this unusual way of looking at Southport's history. So I think I didn't mention this is Armchair History. I'm Liz Fuller with the Southport Historical Society. And I want to thank Full Soy and the uh, Friends of the Library and the Library for helping us spread the word about these programs. So our discussion of World War II was actually going to start with World War I. So as we've talked about in previous programs in Southport history, during World War I, Southport became a military base, and there were over 1,200 soldiers, which was as many men as there were people in the entire town of Southport, and they were stationed at Fort Caswell in 1918 and 1919. Um, but, you know, at that time, people didn't call that war World War I or the First World War because there wasn't any thought that there would ever be a second one. So instead, it went by a couple different names. Um, before the United States got involved, um, a lot of Americans referred to it as the European War or the War in Europe. And then after we were involved, we'd call it the Great War because it was so massive and so many countries were involved. And then for one brief optimistic moment, it also was called the War to End All Wars because it was hoped that we'd learned our lessons and that with the development of the League of Nations, we'd never use war to solve our differences again. It was in that period of optimism that the United States government decided that there was no longer a need for a military fort on Oak Island. They decided to remove the, the giant mortar guns and to beat their swords into plowshares. They sent the soldiers home they removed the artillery and the remaining ammunition and they put the fort into a surplus status and they looked for someone to buy it. And so in 1925, the entire encampment was sold to Caswell Carolina Corporation and they intended to turn it into a resort. Now the Great Depression just delayed their plans but in 1938, the resort opened to the public. Um, they had done a lot of work. They connected um, with Southport. Um, they installed phone lines and electricity. They put in a, a water and sewer system. Um, they refurbished the dwellings, the stables, the lodges, the gymnasium, the theater, the bakery, the dining facilities. They turned the hospital into a hospitality building and they turned the um, officer's quarters, which you see here, into um, uh, rooms that could be rented. They installed a steel pier and a wharf um, fronting on the channel of the Cape Fear River. So this yacht basin was open to travelers and their pleasure boats heading north or south up the coast. The resort was advertised as the best spot midway between Maine and Miami. So this is a brochure that describes this um, resort, including a testimonial from the very first sailor to stay there. He said that he intended to just stay overnight, but that he enjoyed Oak Island and the facilities so much that he stayed for four weeks. Now, one interesting thing to note in that brochure is a reference to the pools of mineral magic. This came about due to a failed attempt by the military to create a drinking well during World War I. The military drilled down to get water, but the water that came up was not what they were looking for. It was filled with minerals and it had a higher salt content than the surrounding seawater. And it was very warm, it was 96 degrees. So it was of no use as drinking water. 
the military sealed it back up and then they went further inland and drilled another well, which did provide drinking water. But when Caswell Carolina Corporation purchased the fort, they were thrilled with the hot mineral spring. They decided to turn the giant gun emplacements that were on top of the battery into swimming pools. So you can see this picture in the upper left-hand corner um, that was taken uh, in 1921 by a soldier that was stationed there. You can see the guns still there. Then down below, you see a picture of the emplacement without the guns in it. That's what it would have looked like after the military left. And then on the right hand side, you'll see that the gun emplacement has been sealed up and filled with water from those um, mineral springs. So they, they filled it with this warm water and, um, and they turned it into a swimming pool. So you talk about beating swords into plowshares, they turned gun batteries into swimming pools. And then underneath, they built um, changing rooms so for people to change in and out of their, their swimsuits. And I would imagine that that would keep them a little warmer because you, there was all that warm water up on top. So the pools were quite popular with the guests. Now this is a photo of some bathing beauties enjoying the waters that I'm sure they used for advertising. If any of you know um, Mary Ellen Watts pool, she's a member of our board and she's presented on several different topics. She talked about her family's charter boat business. Um, this is her great aunt, um, Mercedes or Deezy Watts. And um, she and a friend were modeling um, and how enjoyable these waters were. And this is a picture of Deezy and two of her friends at the resort. They're rinsing off the mineral water. People said swimsuits never look the same after a swim in that mineral water. So since we're gonna be talking about a love story today, I do wanna mention that this picture is the first appearance of our female romantic lead. Um, this picture, uh, this is, you'll see over on the right, Lois Jane Bustles. Now I'll have a better picture of her in a minute. This picture was taken in the late 1930s when Lois Jane was about 19 or 20 years old. So she's gonna be 22 or 23 when she meets her future husband. So here we have Lois Jane with several of her friends. This was also taken at the Fort Caswell Resort. They were making a day of it and enjoying the facilities, um, but it looks like it was a bit chillier on this day and that they had decided to keep their clothes on. Um, it looks like they were having a great time, um, but as we know, this peaceful interlude was not going to last long. In 1939, Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia, and shortly after that, war broke out in Europe again, and the U.S. once more began to prepare for war. So based on their experience in World War I, they realized they needed a naval section base to protect the Cape Fear and the Atlantic shipping lanes from U-boat attacks. And there were U-boats off of North Carolina. So Fort Caswell was the logical choice. So the Caswell Carolina Corporation, they agreed and they set what they considered to be a reasonable sales price um, for the acreage around the fort. They tallied up what they had originally purchased it for, plus the cost of improvements and a small amount of interest. And they said they would sell it, um, the fort and all of its buildings for $500,000, which would be about $9 million um, today. And the US government said, no. They, that was about five times what the military was willing to pay, even a little more than five times. So eventually, as you know, the government uh, what the government wants, the government's going to get. So the two parties came to an agreement and the government bought back Fort Caswell. They established a US Navy station that would serve as a submarine tracking station, a training center, a communication center, a naval inshore patrol and a supply base. And Fort Caswell also functioned as a holding area for wounded US soldiers that were brought in by ship. And the government invested almost a million dollars to make the base operational and to build docking facilities and adapt the reservation's original buildings. They, um, they purchased the, this old military reservation on November 17th, which was just three weeks before the US entered World War II. They had to move pretty quickly after that and operations began in early 1942. Um, so the Navy manned Fort Caswell as a base for patrol craft that were guarding against the infiltration of enemy agents from the sea as well as marauding submarines. 
So from the base's docks in the Cape Fear River, there were various patrol boats, Coast Guard vessels, armed yachts, fishing boats, minesweepers that guarded the coast off the Cape Fear and the frying pan shoals from German U-boats. So the pleasure boats were gone, the private yachts were gone, but the patrol craft that you can see here were actually shrimp trawlers that had been pressed into service by the government and converted into military boats to, um, to, to patrol the coast. So now I'd like to take a minute to introduce you to our male romantic lead in today's story. This is Davis Carroll Herring. Now, unlike Lois Jane, he did not grow up in Southport. Instead, he was from Sampson County, North Carolina. He attended uh, North Carolina State and Wake Forest. He graduated in 1939, and he earned two degrees, one in engineering and one in law. This photo is his class picture um, from 1938, Wake Forest University, where he was also the president of his fraternity, Alpha Pi Delta. So this is Mr. Herring's World War II registration card. So like all men his age, he was required to register for the draft in 1940, the year before we entered the war. So you can see at the time he was living in Cumberland, North Carolina, and he was working at Fort Bragg. He was employed by T.A. Loving and Company. Now that was a construction firm. And in anticipation of the impending war, the U.S. government had awarded T.A. Loving contracts to build major military installations across the Southeast, including Fort Bragg, the Marine Corps Air Station at Cherry Point, and Camp Lejeune. So it's likely that T.A. Loving also was awarded the contract to turn the resort at Fort Caswell back into a military base because Mr. Herring was sent down to Southport to be in charge of the project to convert the Caswell resort back into the Caswell Naval, to Naval Section Base. So he was from North Carolina, which seems to help because he seems to have hit it off pretty quickly with the locals. So here he is. Um, with several leading businessmen in Southport. So you see Paul Fodale on the left, he was a seafood dealer. You see Robert Jones, he was the superintendent of construction at Fort Caswell. That was the project that Davis Herring was overseeing. Robert Jones, if anybody knows Randy Jones, Robert Jones was his father. Randy Jones is the director of tourism in Southport. Um, next to Mr. Herring is Leonard Yaskel. He was um, the postmaster in Southport and he had also been the mayor at one point. And then over to the right is Dr. Elsie Fergus. So as you can see, he fit right in with, with all the, the leading business leaders of Southport at the time. So um, Mr. Herring came to Southport as a civilian. Um, but before too long, he enlisted in the U.S. Navy Reserve. So in this photo, you can see Ensign Davis Herring in his military uniform. And he's hanging out with some of the younger men in Southport. Um, you can see that some of them are holding tennis rackets. So they were getting um, together to play tennis. Next to uh, Ensign Herring is James Harper, the editor and publisher of the Stateport Pilot. And next to him is David Watson, grandson of Dr. D.I. Watson, who owned the pharmacy, which is now, that was on um, Moore Street. It's now the um, Oyster Bar. And Robert Thompson, uh, a Cape Fear River pilot. Now, not too long after this picture was taken, James Harper and David Watson would both be drafted and sent overseas to fight in the war, and Robert Thompson would join the Coast Guard, and Ensign Herring would be um, reassigned to Rhode Island for training. So while these young men were preparing to go to war, Miss Lois Jane was not just sitting idly by. She was doing her part in the war effort by raising money for the Red Cross in Southport. She led a group of women to raise more than $50 from Southport, which would be over $800 in today's currency. She volunteered with other women in Southport to roll bandages and make surgical dressings to be used in the war theater overseas. And she was named the representative from the Brunswick County chapter of the American Red Cross to the New River Camp Davis Camp and Hospital Service uh, Council. So in that role, she helped to procure necessary extras, which seems like such a military term to me. I mean, they're either necessary or they're extra. But the necessary extras that she was um, gathering at that time, she was trying to obtain uh, a piano for the boys at Camp Davis, and also a, a public address system for the hospital there. So 
Both our romantic leads were very busy with the war effort, working in their own circles. Um, now, I would assume that there were a lot of young men in Southport and at the military base who were trying to catch Lois Jane's eye. Ensign Herring had to find some way to get her attention if he wanted to go from this to this. So I don't know the full story of how they met, but in my research, I did stumble across a newspaper article that implied that just like in a Hollywood movie, the couple had what is known as a meet cute. So I don't know, do you know what a meet cute is? If not, I'm gonna tell you. So a meet cute is a scene in which the two people who will form a future romantic couple meet for the first time, typically under unusual, humorous, or cute circumstances. This type of scene is a staple of romantic comedies, though it can also occur in sitcoms and even soap operas. So there you go. Um, now, I wouldn't say that Davis and Lois Jane were living in a romantic comedy, but they definitely had a budding romance. And it appears to me that Davis found his opening to get noticed by Lois Jane. So in April, 1942, about five months after the war had been declared, Lois Jane uh, was working hard to raise funds for the Navy Relief Society. So she had decided to organize a dance at the Southport High School Gymnasium. The only problem was that she didn't have a band, which was pretty critical to the success of the dance. So I just love that. It just sounds like some kind of movie plot, right? Oh, I wanna put on a dance. Oh, I don't have a band. Whatever shall I do? So I'm gonna read you part of the article, um, which I'm pretty sure was written by Davis's good friend, James Harper, editor and publisher of the newspaper. So it says, State College Band comes to aid of sweet charity. 14 gallant college boys came to the aid of a maiden in distress during this past weekend to collaborate on putting on a swell dance in the Southport High School Gymnasium Saturday night for the benefit of the Navy Relief Society. Miss Lois Jane Bussells, who already had done a lot of work on the committee in charge of raising funds for the society in this county, hit upon the idea of having a benefit dance. And since it had been a long time since the last event of its kind hereabouts, the thought was happily received. But then the matter of securing an orchestra good enough to draw a crowd and in a figure that would net a profit threatened to stop the show. The best efforts of two generations of statemen were set into motion, and between Bill Wells and Davis Herring, arrangements were made to secure the music of Tommy Heritage and his statesmen. So Davis Herring, because he had gone to state, um, had some connections there, and he um, used those to help um, get a band for Lois Jane, who was described here as a damsel in distress. So when he graduated from college, Ensign Davis had already proved that he was book smart, but this says to me that he was also relationship smart and his efforts paid off because this dance was held in April of 1942. And just six months later in October of 1942, Miss Bustle's parents announced their daughter's engagement to Ensign Herring, who by then was already away on assignment in Rhode Island. Now in combing through the newspapers, I couldn't help but notice what a whirlwind of activity this engagement set off. So as you can see, she announced her engagement in the Raleigh papers on the 11th um, because she had an aunt that lived there. And then the following Friday, she attended a shower. Um, the next week, the engagement was announced in the Southport newspaper. And on the 30th, there was a second shower with tea and cake. So that was a goodly amount of activity. But then in the, moving into November, there was a surprise linen shower followed by a buffet supper then a buffet dinner, then a handkerchief shower. Finally, she got a break on Sunday for church. And then Monday was the rehearsal followed by the rehearsal dinner. And on Tuesday, an evening wedding followed by a reception at her parents' house. And then late that evening, she and, the, and her new groom left on their wedding trip. Now, you can see that each of these events were held at different people's homes. You've got the McCalls, the Watsons, the Thompsons, the Ruarks the Christians, um, and there was some variety in who attended the different events, but there was a core group of Lois Jane and her bridesmaids and her mother um, who attended all or nearly all of the events. 
So um, two of the bridesmaids can be seen in this photo. On the left is Miss Wilma Barnett, and um, then on the right is Miss uh, Leela Hubbard, who was actually Mrs. Dallas Piggott by that time. I don't have photos of her other two bridesmaids, but they were Lib Watson, the sister of David Watson, who I showed you earlier, and then Lois Dane's cousin, who was visiting from Massachusetts, Zipporah Rice. I found it interesting to see how the ladies entertained themselves at all of these gatherings. At least three of the events included playing bridge. And so in addition to the, the gifts that they gave the bride, there were awards for the highest and lowest score in bridge. Some of the events included Chinese checkers, which was really popular at the time. So Chinese checkers wasn't really invented in China, but it, they gave it that name because things from the Orient were um, popular in the early 1900s. And the ladies also played bingo. So at the, those um, showers, there were prizes for the winners of these games as well. Now, even though it was only about a year into the war, they were already um, rationing of quite a few things. So of course, gasoline and rubber was, was rationed, but also um, sugar and meat, eggs, shortening, butter. So it was interesting to me to see how the folks managed to entertain within those constraints. At one party, um, chicken salad was served. So I assume they got around the meat rationing on that because the chicken probably came from their own flock. Um, in the paper, they didn't mention whether the salad was served on Ritz crackers, but since Ritz crackers first became available in 1934, it's a possibility. At another party, they served finger sandwiches. So if they were cucumber sandwiches like the ones in this picture, then they could have used homegrown cucumbers for the sandwiches and not had to use their ration book. Another item served at one of the parties was congealed salad. Um, and I love this because congealed salad is one of those dishes that's so closely associated with Southern cooking. They didn't uh, mention what flavor they served. So I just um, showed several pictures of ones that I thought looked festive and like a, a sh wedding shower. At another party, they mentioned that they served heart-shaped tea cakes. So I found these vintage aluminum cake pans uh, that would have been from that time. So they might've been the kind of pans they used to cook the cakes. So cakes were served at uh, several of the showers that uh, they held for Lois Jane. So depending on what the hostesses were short of due to rationing, they might've used one of these recipes that used a reduced amount of eggs or even no eggs um, or no butter or no shortening or no milk or even no sugar. Women got very creative in their ability for their, um, to cook for their families and to entertain for their friends. So as I was researching those cake recipes, I came across an article written by Miss Susie Carson, the co-founder of the Southport Historical Society. So Miss Susie was writing about cooking during World War II and she said, most women cooked on iron wood burning stoves, though a few used the more modern oil stoves. Somewhere along the way, my mama acquired an oil stove and it was placed right next to the wood stove. So when I read that, I, I was blown away. They mentioned wood burning stoves. So my question was, does that mean they were wood burning ovens? Is that how people baked back then? Were these ladies making all these cakes in wood fired ovens? So I reached out to um, Catherine Huffam. I don't know if she's on the call today, but Catherine is on our board. And her mother, um, Trudy Young, is a longtime member of the Southport Historical Society. Now, Miss Trudy would have been a little girl during World War II, but I thought she might remember what the stoves were like. And she said that, yes, the stoves and the oven were wood powered and that you put the wood in on the side and you kept the fire going there. And also Miss Trudy said that just like Susie, um, her family also had an oil stove that they put next to the wood one. So I actually had never seen this. So I did some digging and I found this picture. And I, um, I particularly like this picture because it clearly showed the fire on the left and the bread baking on the right. And then I did some research on baking wood stoves because some people do it today and found that um, as you'd expect, um, the heating is pretty un is uneven. There'll be like hot spots. So things will break too fast there and not, not fast enough someplace else. So the suggestion was to put a pan of water in the oven as well, which would somehow um, even out the heating. But it seems to me that that would create steam, which would also affect your bread or your cake that you'd sort of be steaming it. So I'm not really sure how it all works. 
If anyone knows, I would be really interested to hear. So at one of the parties, there was an individual, what they uh, entertained with, each table that people were uh, sitting at had an individual sized wedding cake, which I thought was really fun. And on top of each cake, there was a wedding couple cake topper. So cake toppers first came into fashion in the 1940s when this was going on. So it would have been very trendy to have these cake toppers. So I don't know if the hostess used real ceramic cake toppers or she had um, created some, um, some homemade ones, but I thought you all might be interested in seeing a variety of some vintage cake toppers that were from that era. So these are some real ceramic ones that would have been from uh, World War II. Now, Southport was no longer a dry town in 1942, but still it wouldn't have been fashionable to serve um, alcohol at a party for ladies, even um, white wine, which would be served today. So at several of the parties, they served um, fruit punch and at others, they served a warm beverage called Russian tea. Now, despite its name, Russian tea was actually an American drink um, that started to become uh, popular in the 1880s. So like Chinese checkers, it was given an exotic name to make it sound fancier. Um, this drink was especially popular in the South where it was traditionally served at social events in the fall and the winter like these showers would have been. So the recipes vary, but the most common ingredients are black tea, orange peel or orange juice or lemons, cinnamon, cloves, and vanilla. So I'm on the lookout for a good recipe for Russian tea. So if anyone has one, let me know. So another strong Southern tradition is monogramming. Um, often linens and towels were monogrammed. So you may remember that I mentioned that one of Lois Jane's shower was a surprise linen shower where all of the guests gave her linens to use to start her new home. So one story about this shower um, was that um, one of the gifts almost caused Lois Jane to lose her composure for a moment. So it seems that her cousin who was from Massachusetts gave her a gift of pillowcases. And Lois Jane opened the gift expecting them to have a monogram like kind of like this one that I'm showing you here um, now that had her initials and her new last name. But to her surprise, she saw different letters on the pillowcases and those who were watching her closely saw a look of confusion and maybe dismay across her face as she thought that the gift was a mistake. Because you see the pillowcase had MR on it instead of her initials. So her first assumption was that her cousin had made a mistake and gotten the wrong initials embroidered on the cases. But then very quickly, um, she recovered and she figured out that the pillowcases were decorated with Mr. and Mrs. So my assumption is that her cousin wasn't sure how to deal with the fact that the bride-to-be's name was Lois Jane and that to be accurate, the monogram would include the J um, for Jane which would have messed up the design. So since she wasn't that probably that familiar with monograms, she went the safer route and stuck with Mr. and Mrs. And I'm not really clear how it should be. So if, if anybody wants to share at the end, I'd be happy to, to uh, find that out. Another of Lois Jane's showers was a crystal shower where every guest gave her a piece of the pattern that she had selected. So I don't know what her crystal looked like, but I do have a collection of my own grandmother's crystal from about the same era. So my grandmother, Verena, was married in 1936, about six years before Lois Jane. So it's possible that it looked very similar to this. Um, Lois Jane also had one general shower and they didn't list the gifts that she received. Um, it's likely that they were all small household items. They wouldn't have been like appliances or vacuum, things like that. Even her parents wouldn't have been able to get her appliances because the production of vacuum cleaners and kitchen appliances um, was banned until the war ended. Housewives were cautioned to keep their existing appliances in good working order because they could not be replaced. So this is a booklet that was put out by the Pacific Gas and Electric Company uh, a manual for the care and use of home appliances for the lady of the house and her mechanical servants. And inside it actually says, uh, as a consumer in the total defense of democracy, I will do my part to make my home, my community, my country ready, efficient, and strong. I will buy carefully. I will take good care of the things I have. I will waste nothing. So that's a huge contrast during the war years 
um, versus a few years later when Americans suddenly are being encouraged to consume and consume and consume. But in the 40s, it was patriotic to, um, to consume carefully. So at another shower, uh, there was also a bridge in Chinese checkered party. Uh, the attendees got together and presented Lois Jane with an evening handkerchief. So I don't exactly know what it looked like, but I imagine it looked similar to this. It most likely was not a silk handkerchief because silk was being reserved for the war effort to make parachutes for the troops. And it definitely wasn't Japanese silk uh, because that was not allowed at all because we were at war with Japan. So another one of her showers was a handkerchief shower in which each of the attendees gave her a handkerchief. So those of you who attended my March program on the nurses of World War I might remember my slight disappointment when the women's club sent a package of handkerchiefs to the nurse from Southport who was serving in, in the war in France. I had kind of been hoping for something a bit more festive. I'm sure she was happy with it, I was hoping for something more. So when I saw this reference in the newspaper to a handkerchief shower, I realized there must be more to these handkerchiefs than I'm realizing. So I did some research and I learned that during the depression of the 1930s, women didn't have the means to buy new clothes and often they could only afford a new hanky as a fashion accessory. So a lady would change her outfit by sporting a different hanky um, with her outfits. Now, in the 40s and with World War II, it was considered unpatriotic to buy a lot of clothes and to, to spend a lot of money on things like that. You should be buying war bonds instead. So women collected a whole wardrobe of hankies and they would drape them over their belts. They would tie them on their wrists. They would have them peeking out of pockets or they'd tuck them through a buttonhole. So after I learned this, um, I talked to my mom. Um, now, um, she would have been a little girl in World War II, but I asked her what she remembered about handkerchiefs, if, if anything. So she told me a story I'd never heard before. She said that for about 20 years, my grandmother and her six sisters would always exchange handkerchiefs on every birthday. And they'd spend a lot of time shopping for the right one, picking out just the right one to give. And my mom didn't say this, but knowing the ladies in my family, I can only imagine that there was also a bit of a competition among the sisters to see whose handkerchief the birthday girl wore first. So anyway, after hearing these stories, I changed my mind about handkerchiefs and now I'm, I'm really into them. Um, I, I told my mom, boy, I wish that I had some of my grandmother's um, collection of handkerchiefs after learning that. And so would you believe that she was able to lay her hand on six of the handkerchiefs and she mailed them to me that very afternoon. So this is a picture of my new collection of vintage family handkerchiefs. So if anyone else has their own collection of handkerchiefs, um, I think it would be fun to do an exhibit, even if we did a virtual exhibit with pictures. Um, and of course, if they're Southport handkerchiefs, we could probably make you know an in-person one. So just let me know if you also have a handkerchief collection. So one more side note, my mom told a friend of hers about my newfound interest in handkerchiefs. And her friend told my mom a story about handkerchiefs. So it turns out um, this friend, I believe her name was Anne, um, a few years ago, Anne um, became a widow. She lost her husband. And right before she went to the funeral, a good friend dropped by and she gave her a present of a lovely lavender handkerchief to carry with her to the service. And even after all this time, the thoughtfulness of that gift still really touched her. So I mention this because that's two family history stories that came up this past week, simply by talking about handkerchiefs. And another one that came up um, by talking about baking cakes. So it just shows that you never know what is going to trigger family memories and it really pays to ask those questions about daily life in the past. So now at last, the big day had arrived. The wedding itself was held at seven o'clock in the evening at Trinity Methodist Church. Now, one item I thought was unusual was um, that they did not send out wedding invitations within Southport. They just posted a notice in the paper that all of the couple's um, friends were invited and should attend. So I don't know if that was a cost saving uh, measure because of the war, they were supposed to be saving postage or they were worried, or they were worried they'd forget somebody. somebody. I don't know why they did it. I didn't see similar notices for other weddings, um, but I also didn't page through all the newspapers um, from that time period. 
So the wedding was a beautiful one, um, even though you could see that they were still adhering to the, the rationing, the limitations of the time um, and the recent um, depression. So they, they decorated the church with um, silva, which was a, a traditional Southern plant for weddings. You can see a picture of it there on the right, plus um, ferns and pine boughs. So they probably gathered all of those things themselves, because um, we know we have plenty of those. It was an evening ceremony. It was at seven o'clock in the evening in November, so it was dark. The church was lit by uh, candles on candelabras. Uh, the colors that the of the wedding were bronze and blue. So this picture in the center is the inside of the church. If you've never been inside it, it's 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 absolutely beautiful. You can see, um, and so they. The, um, the bride carried copper chrysanthemums that kind of uh, picked up the colors of the, of the interior of the church. Um, two of the brides, there were four bridesmaids, two of them wore blue dresses, similar to the, um, the stained glass windows, and two wore copper. And the ceremony was performed by the bride's pastor and also um, the groom's uncle, who was a minister. So some people have asked me whether all of this fuss about Lois, Jane, and, and Davis's wedding was common for every wedding in Southport at that time. And from what I've seen by looking in the newspapers, I would have to say no. This was a more elaborate ceremony and quite a bit more showers than was usual. And I would, my guess is that it was due to a combination of things. One, um, the bride came from an old Southport family. They were well-known, well-established, well-liked. They were um, probably able to afford a bit more ceremony. Um, also, the bride appeared to be very popular. Bride and groom were both very popular in town, and so there were a lot of people who wanted to celebrate and wish them well. Um, and on top of all that, Lois Jane was going to be leaving town immediately after the wedding. Her husband, Anton Davis, was being assigned to a new position at the shipyard in Washington, D.C. So this was also a farewell to Lois Jane, at least for a while. So I don't want to give the impression that all of this was this elaborate weddings um, was, was common in Southport. So um, just like in a movie, a romantic couple found true love and they had their perfect storybook wedding. And if this had been a movie, it would have ended right there with them heading off on their honeymoon with the assumption being that they would live happily ever after. But life isn't a Hollywood movie and sad and worrisome events eventually happen to everyone sooner or later. And unfortunately for Mr. and Mrs. Herring, it would turn out to be sooner. So less than a year after their wedding, Lois Jane's father, Captain Irving Bonner Bustles, passed away very suddenly. Mary Bustles, his wife of 27 years, was left a widow. Around that same time, Ensign Herring, by then Lieutenant Herring, <clears throat> was sent overseas with the Navy. Lois Jane, Mary's only child, moved back home to live with her mother. She was expecting her first baby, and preparing for the upcoming baby probably provided a welcome distraction for both mother and daughter. In February of 1944, just four months after her father had passed away, Lois Jane gave birth to a daughter. The baby was named Mary Louise after her two grandmothers, but she was always called Measy for short. Four months after her, um, the baby was born, the Allied troops invaded the beaches of Normandy. More than 2,000 U.S. soldiers lost their lives in that battle, and Lieutenant Herring was nearly one of them. He was seriously injured in the encounter and was awarded the Purple Heart. Lois Jane must have had many sleepless nights wondering if her baby would have the chance to meet her father. Less than two months after that, on the 1st of August, 1944, Lois Jane had another sleepless night when a severe hurricane raged through Southport. It was still six years before we began the practice of naming hurricanes, so this unnamed August storm caused more damage than Brunswick County had experienced in years. This is the aftermath of that hurricane. This view is from the southwest corner of the garrison near the weather tower. In that storm, the Rob Thompson fuel dock near the center of the photo was destroyed and the end of the nearshore United Shrimp Company dock was taken off. So this damage was about a block or two down Bay Street from Mary and Lois Jane's family home. This is a view across the street from their house. These tourist cabins were located on the Southport waterfront where the Riverside Motel now stands. They were the forerunners of the more modern motel accommodations which now serve the area. 
Mary and her husband, Captain Bustles, had built them in the early 1940s. So you can see all of that rubbish that's piled up in front. That was due to the storm. And this is another view on Bay Street taken at the end of those series of cottages with the, uh, the cottages and the waterfront and the shrimp house. So luckily the family home on the other side of Bay Street where Lois Jane, her mother and the baby were staying was relatively unscathed. So the women set about cleaning up the debris, starting over and waiting for the war to come to an end. So while they do that, it's probably a good time to explain about their beautiful home, which had been in Lois Jane's family for several generations. So Lois Jane's father was a bustle, but her mother, Mary, was a dosher. This is a photo of Mary's grandfather, John Julius Dosher. J.J. Dosher was a river pilot and a blockade runner during the Civil War. So this is a photo of him with his fellow river pilots. J.J. Dosher and his wife had seven children, five of whom lived to adulthood. So it's likely you've heard of their son, J. Arthur Dosher, because Southport's Hospital is named after him. Mary was descended from Dr. Dosher's older brother, Richard. Richard Dosher was a successful merchant and the owner of a shrimp factory. He built the house on Bay Street in 1892. He and his wife had five children, but only two survived to adulthood, Lois Jane's mother, Mary, and her sister, Lois. Lois Dosher married and moved to Raleigh where she became an executive in the tele uh, Television Association. So when Lois Jane's grandfather passed away, her mother inherited the house. Then in 1972, when Mary passed away, Lois Jane, her only child, inherited the house from her. So after the war, uh, Davis Herring, a civilian once more, returned to Southport and his wife's family home. And there they settled in to build a life together. A couple of years later, in 1948, their son, Davis Carroll Herring Jr., known as Davy, was born. And with that, their family was complete. They continued to live in the family home and the children grew up there. Davis began work as an attorney in town. He was well liked and contributed greatly to the community. He served as an alderman and for 39 years he served on the board of the Security Savings and Loan. He invested in land in the area, purchasing a couple of miles of land on Oak Island and also a few acres along where the dock of the Fort Fisher Ferry now stands. He was well respected in the community and he gave the graduation address at Southport High School in 1960. The children, Measy and Davis Jr., known as Davy, enjoyed their wonder years growing up in Southport in the 1950s and 60s. They both married and had children. Uh, after Measy married, she and her new family moved away for, for about 20 years um, where she raised her family and she enjoyed a career as a social worker. When she returned to Southport, she indulged her passion for flowers by opening a florist shop and serving as the chairwoman for the Flower Guild for St. Philip's Episcopal Church. She was also an appointee to the North Carolina Southeastern Economic Development Commission, and she followed in her father and grandfather's footsteps by serving several terms on the city's board of aldermen. In a 2014 interview with Southport Magazine, Misey described her family life growing up. She said, my mother was very active. My mother and my brother were very athletic. My father and I were not so, but we did everything they did. We all water skied, we all played golf. My brother and mother just excelled at it. My mother had hole in one for ladies at the golf course. She taught lots of people to water ski. Whatever the family did, we all did. We just didn't do it as well. In fact, in 1965, Lois Jane won the Southeastern North Carolina Ladies Golf League Open, and in 1966, she won the Women's Golf Championship at Oak Island Golf Club. And then she also continued her work with the Red Cross, and she participated in the Southport Women's Club. So by all accounts, Davis and Lois Jane lived happy lives in Southport, raising their families and contributing to their community. Sadly, they passed away too young. Davis died in 1988 at the age of 70 after some prolonged health problems. So you may remember this photo that I showed you of these young men taken right before they headed off to war. They all survived their ordeal and they remained lifelong friends. I thought it was particularly poignant that when Davis Herring died, his three friends served as pallbearers and his friend James Harper wrote his obituary. 
So I'm just gonna read that to you briefly. It says, um, the sanctuary of Trinity United Methodist Church was filled Friday afternoon with friends who came to pay their last respects to a man many had known for a long, long time. From them, we heard over and over again, the simple statement, I wish all these people could have known Davis before he became an invalid. It was our pleasure to know him as a boy growing up in Sampson County and later as a young engineer who came to oversee the job of converting Fort Caswell into a US Naval section base for use during World War II. He cut short the civilian duty to volunteer for active service in the Navy and he almost got more than he bargained for when he was wounded during the Normandy invasion while in command of a vessel ferrying US Army troops across the English Channel. Davis had married the prettiest girl in town, Lois Jane Bustles, so after the war, it was no surprise that he came here looking for a place to settle down. Almost completely overlooked to that point in his life was the fact that in addition to an engineer's degree from North Carolina State, he also held a law degree from Wake Forest. He became associated with Bun Frank in the practice of law and later became the law partner of Ray Walton. And it is in this latter role that he is best remembered. Last week, we mentioned the special service he had performed as a director of Security Savings and Loan Association, but this was only one of his fields of interest. Off and on for many years, he was the legal advisor to aldermen for the city of Southport and to members of the county board of commissioners. He was their counselor, and not only was his advice respected, his integrity was unquestioned. It was a privilege to have been a fellow citizen of someone like Davis Herring. Davis's wife, Lois Jane, passed away three years later at the age of 72. With their parents gone, the family home then passed to Measy and Davy. After 100 years, they didn't want to see the home slip out of the family's hands. So they decided to turn the home into a bed and breakfast, even though neither one of them had ever actually stayed in one. So you've probably figured out by now that the house today is none other than Lois Jane's Riverview Inn named after Lois Jane herself. And to this day, nearly 30 years later, it is still family owned and family run. And even though this Southport love story isn't a Hollywood movie, Lois Jane's Riverview Inn has hosted some honest to goodness Hollywood movie guests. When the movie Safe Haven was being filmed in Southport, the director and writer stayed at the Lois Jane Riverview Inn b, &B. And many times the actors would join them on the porch to discuss the day's work. And remember those tourist cottages that Captain and Mary Bustles built in the early 1940s? Well, Mary Bustles replaced them with a brand new motel lodge in 1954. Now, anyone who knows anything about Southport history knows that 1954 is the same year that Hurricane Hazel, the only Category 4 hurricane to hit North Carolina in the 20th century, plowed into Southport. Fortunately, the motel had been built of cinder blocks and it survived the storm. Nearly 70 years later, the motel still exists on the waterfront and is still family owned and family run to this day. The rooms all have their own swings that look out over the water. And the rooms all look out on the Oak Island Lighthouse and Fort Caswell, the site that first brought Davis Carroll Herring to Southport, where he found the love of his life, Miss Lois Jane Bustles. So I hope now when you walk around Southport and you pass by Lois Jane's Riverview Inn and the Riverfront Motel, you'll be reminded of Davis and Lois Jane and their World War II story of romance. And when you walk past St. Philip's Episcopal Church, I hope you'll think of their daughter, Mary Louise Measy Child, who contributed so much to Southport as an alderman, a business owner, and a longtime volunteer for her church. And be sure to look for the statue that was created to commemorate Measy. It embodies her joyful spirit. It shows her signature floppy hat and illustrates her devotion to flowers and to cultivating her Southport garden. So I hope you've enjoyed this first in my series of Southport in Love and War and that you come back for more. And I'm gonna turn the screen around and see if you have any questions. So anybody, questions, comments? Um, Liz, the picture that you had with Robert Jones, 
and Paul Fodell, Mr. Herring, that Robert Jones was actually Randy's grandfather. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Because his name was Robert also. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. Because his dad thought... was born in 1927, so he wouldn't have been old enough to have participated in that. But his father um, was married to Grace, his grandfather was married to Grace Jones, who was Dr. Dozier's daughter. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate that. A couple of things, Liz. Um, yes. First of all, when I was a young girl and living in Greensboro, um, and a little Southern Baptist girl, I came to Caswell um, for summer camp and swam in the pools on top of the uh, really? fortifications. Yes. At that time was before they built the pool that they have now. And so um, it yeah. always kind of tickles me to see those pictures of um, the, the swimming pools. And it was quite an adventure for little kids to be able to flop around in that water on top of the buildings. Yeah, I, I remember that. that. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing at Lois Jane's um, b, &B um, well, I've been here 25 years now, but it always seems like just a few years ago, uh, the um, Historical Society sponsored a ladies uh, tea there. Oh, really? And uh, we had tea in the yard next door uh, that's a, a vacant lot now that can be used for events like that and also um, inside the house in the di beautiful dining room was set up with um, uh, the tea cakes and and the tea so that was a nice fundraising uh, project that we did um, and everybody enjoyed being in Lois Jane's B&B &B for that event yeah that's wonderful. we could do it again sometime maybe yeah, that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Excellent program. I loved every minute of it. Thank you for a all bit, your research. A bit different um, kind of program. Yes. Than what it, we've been doing. Very, very sweet. Yeah. I thought it was kind of fun. Um, anybody have anything else? Catherine, thank you for your help in uh, researching um, things and for your um, corrections on a couple of the pictures. So thank you. You're welcome. And you know, I worked for Davis for five years in the law firm with Susie Carson and I were in the same law firm. It was Pravat oh, here in Pravat yeah. and Owens. I worked there for five years before I went to work at Carolina Power and Light. Nice. Mm. It's good to have native girls around. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also Libby, Wal Libby Merritt, who's on our board, her father's law firm, his name was Ray Walton. And so oh. Davis and Ray and Ernest Parker and Bud Powell had an um, office where the guitar strings building is behind oh, yeah. the Dozier Flea Market. That uh -huh. they that. Okay, yes, because that name, I didn't realize to make the connection with that in the mm -hmm. obituary. So that's mm -hmm. interesting. So it's, I, I think it's really, um, interesting to find out i mean and you, and you think of the randomness of it i mean if he hadn't happened to come down here to work on that project then they wouldn't have met and you know i mean every family has those stories right when you think back on how your parents met and if things hadn't happened then you know you wouldn't be here or if you had, you know i just think that's really uh it's really interesting to to think about all right um, so, uh, like I said, I'm going to do an another um, presentation on Southport and Lovermore next month, and that one will be talking about um, Joy Arnold, and she was um, uh, Southport's Rosie, the answer to Rosie the Riveter, um, and I have some actual, um, we did an oral history interview with her, so I'm trying to be trying to play some clips from that oral history interview so you can hear Joy actually um, uh, explaining her, her stories herself. So, so I hope you'll be able to, to come to that. And if you have no more questions, um, then we'll see you next month. Great job. Okay, yep. thanks. thanks, Liz, as always.